Hi, this is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth for another exciting video cast that will help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. And we always feature special guests. And today, my special guest is Lane Kawaoka. Welcome, Lane. Aloha from Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks for having me, Wayne. It's 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 five hours earlier over there. So he's just waking up and he's only had like three cups of coffee by now. So um, but we'll you know, we'll try to we'll try to gear into the Hawaii vibe. I've been there once. It's one of my favorite places on Earth. Went to Maui. I haven't been to Oahu yet, but uh, got a lot of clients who own property there. And it's uh, very expensive to live there from what I understand. Yeah, you're not going to make it out here by being a W-2 employee. You're going to have to be partially on the investor quadrant, right? Got it. Got it. Well, we're going to talk about that. Lane is a, he's a bona fide real estate investor and not the typical guy that gets on, on, on these seminars and tries to sell you something that you don't need. He's really got some advice for us today. So we're going to try to drill into that. But before we get there, Lane, you started out at University of Washington and then you became a, an engineer of all things. What attracted you to engineering? Why did you become an engineer? And tell us about the early part of your career and how you evolved over time. Yeah, I mean, I, I call this the linear path, right? Like, you know, I was kind of taught to go to school, study hard. Um, funny you asked that question in that way. Like, the, I think the reason why I picked engineering is I, I Googled it, you know, back before Google was super popular. I Googled <laughs> it. I was like, what's the most amount of pay that I can get? without having to go to like grad school and ridiculous amounts of student debt to get. And when you do that, you know, you typically have four or five different engineering degrees on there. So right. I don't know, maybe I was just happened to be good at math and science too, a little bit. And, and, but you know, that's, I think a lot of kids and, you know, a lot of, you know, myself included, you're kind of on this path of, you know, just go get this white collar job. Um, whether you like it or not. And that's kind of, you know, went to University of Washington, got my bachelor's in industrial engineering, later got my master's in construction management, civil engineering. But I was put into this job, you know, working for the railroad as a construction supervisor, construction manager. And boy, did I not like it. Right. And, um, but I you, got you were out a there pretty on good the, salary doing you that. You were out there on the rails, right? Testing and, and, and designing and making sure everything was up to snuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science, right? It's a bunch of railroad ties and rail. Um, and, and maybe that's, you know, I was not a very good engineer in college, right? I had like a 3.1 GPA. I was okay. not the one to design anything. Um, you know, people remember that spider question they have on all the exams with the degrees of the spider web going this way and the spiders two kilonewtons. Like I could never do that. Right. I still don't know. <laughs> I mean, I can't do that. Like, I, and what do you do when you're not, you know, that type of academic? Well, you go into project management and that's what I did. <laughs> okay. You know, engineering though is not an easy major. I, I lived on a hall with a bunch of engineers. I was an accounting major and then a, and went to law school, but, but the engineering engineers were just struggling. They were, it was always in first year, particularly it was, it was weeding out everybody at the university of Virginia where I went. And I got to say that uh, it was kind of scary to watch them have to go through their first year as compared to what I had to do, which was basically nothing. I didn't have to work at all. And I still ended up coming out of uh, undergrad and, you know, making a decent living, but it's professional services, right? And so there's, there's always a cap on what you can do if you are an engineer, you may get a good starting salary to begin with, but you know, where can you go with that unless you do get into project management or unless you do get into executive level uh, services? And so you must have had some kind of realization because now you're into real estate investment. How did you morph from being an engineer using your math and science background and the training that you got into what you're doing today? Yeah. So, so I start to work and start to make some good money. Um, you know, thankfully, my parents kind of brought us up in, you know, with good financial skills, don't buy more than you make and save your money, you know, do the Roth IRA, 401k, traditional stuff. And then part of that whole shebang is buying a house to live in, which I don't yeah. necessarily think is a good idea for some people out there, you know, people who are better with their money in particular. So I, you know, a couple of years, I saved up 80 grand to go buy a house in Seattle. 
All right. And because I was traveling all over for work, 100% travel all the time, I I was never home. And, you know, for a young 20, young, early 20 year old kid, that was, you know, seemed a little silly, right? So I just started to rent it out. And then I realized, wow, this is a lot of good beer money right here that I'm making. <laughs> I, you know, I knew nothing about like the 50% rule, rent, good rent of values. I just knew I was, you know, the mortgage was 2,200 and the rent, I was, the rents was like 2,200, the mortgage was 1,600 and I was like making good money. But then, you know, that went on for a couple of months. I had a professional property manager, you know, to, dealing with that for me. And that was kind of where I was like realizing like, wait a minute, why, why would I want to put money in a 401k and all this traditional investments where there's high fees and, you know, it doesn't do very well and you pay a lot in taxes where, you know, I was making money with cash flow the tenant was paying down my mortgage. That's the big difference between you owning your house and being in a rental. Right. And then the tax, you know, the tax benefits, which you can go into. And that was to me like the chink in the armor, right? Or the, the wizard of all just isn't real right behind the man behind the curtain. And I just started to like put all, like I got really motivated at that point, started to learn a lot and started to save more and more of my money and, you know, bought a couple more units in Seattle a few years later, you know, okay. This was back, bought the first one in 2010 and then next in 2012. And then 2012, I started to get involved in these turnkey rentals that you hear a lot about. Um, you know, where Tell these, me about that. Tell me yeah, about so the turn, turnkey, turnkey rental. Turnkey rental, like an outfit, you know, house flipper will, you know, take over property and they'll rehab it with tenant grade fixtures, you know, new appliances, new paint job, new plumbing, electrical. And then they'll sell it to, you know, lazy investors like myself who want a turnkey asset. Sometimes I even put a tenant in there for you. So I went and bought like 11 of these things in 2000, you know, 2015, I had 11 of these things, which was, you know, amazing, right? I had a few thousand dollars of passive cash flow a month, but that was where I kind of hit the wall. You know, for each individual person, you're kind of limited to 10 Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. But more importantly, from like a headache perspective, you know, I'll tell you what it's like to own 11 rentals. Like you're going to have an eviction or two every year. And maybe one third of those times, these deadbeats will trash a property. And, yes. you know, on my YouTube channel, I have like a couple of videos of like a walkthrough of they just trash it. And it's like 10, 20 grand of repairs. And then in addition to that, you maybe have some kind of big catastrophe that happens every quarter out of those 11 rentals. And, you know, like a tree falling on the house or a flood in the, you know, basement or something like that. Right. Like these things happen. And yeah, you have professional property management to deal with that headache, but it becomes a quite a bit of a, a headache. And that was kind of where I was making my next genesis as an investor becoming more of an accredited investor, getting my net worth over a million dollars and starting to really interact with other accredited investors out there and started to realize, hey, there's another level to this and start to get more involved in private placements and syndications at that point. Now, are you doing private placements of investments today? Yeah, so that's kind of where, so I got in, I, I was, 2015, 16, I was kind of selling off the little rental properties as that's what a lot of these other investors much more experienced than I was doing at that time. And, you know, kind of the, uh, the whole caterpillar changing into a cocoon and coming out as the butterfly. But I think the hard thing is when you get involved in that world of, you know, private placements and syndications is, you know, the people that you work with is very important. And when you're starting out, you're kind of not getting, you're kind of getting the bottom of the barrel, right? There's a lot of people out there that are starting out new, faking it till they make it. And there's some shysters out there in that world. And, you know, I got bit a few times in these, you know, these arrangements with how? that. How did you get, how did you get hurt? In those arrangements? Uh, well, in one particular case, um, guy just kind of ran off with the money. Um, I kind of write about this on my website, um, chronicle the whole thing. Uh, another time, you know, I thought the guy was trustworthy, but the guy was, you know, taking taking money and putting it into some of his other assets, right? Oh and it took me a while to uncover that. And that one, you know, I was, you know, part of a partnership with and had to remove him. And, you know, some other times, you know, these guys, you know, they, they didn't do anything dishonest. They just were incompetent. 
and didn't do what they were say or they're going to do. Couldn't project manage. And this is kind of where I, 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 you know, maybe I just got a little frustrated, but I was like, well, why don't I just run these deals with a partner? And, you know, that's kind of where, where we kind of took off from 2016 to, you know, current today. Part of that is I didn't trust anybody. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you have to, you have to know who you're getting in bed with. It is a, a very, uh, it can be a very sketchy business depending on where you're investing and what kind of properties you're buying and that type of thing. I'm familiar with that. Let me ask you a question. Interest rates were low in 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Then they started to come up after COVID and today they're, they're much, much higher. How has that affected your strategy? Yeah. I mean, we haven't really bought anything after summer of 22, right? When interest rates start to pop up. Okay. Um, I think what you're seeing now is prices came down 30%. So if you're a new investor, this is probably one of the best times in the last dozen years to get started and learn about these types of, you know, opportunities. Um, right now, you know, this beginning of 2024 and probably throughout the rest of this year, I don't know if we're going to buy anything, you know, that we would have done several years ago because yeah, you can get things at a discount. But the capital markets are what we call where you get the loans from. Right. You, you know, you, you can't get 70% loan to values anymore. It's down to like 50%, meaning that I'm going to have to bring a lot more to the table. So even though I'm getting like a nice discount on the property from a couple of years ago, the return on investment economics just don't work. So we've been kind of focusing, you know, on different, you know, opportunities like ground up development, for example. And then some other triple nets and, you know, land royalty types of opportunities. Cause, you know, you know, in a way, like to use a baseball analogy, you know, we take what we get, right? If we get an outside pitch, which we kind of have right now, you know, in this case, a high interest environment, just can't make those value add types of multifamily properties work. But there are always other opportunities out there in the are world. Are you investing only in multifamily uh, residential type properties today? That's kind of where we got our start as operators. So we're very versed in that. And, you know, we don't want to kind of get outside of our skis as an operator. But again, with that door kind of closed and not wanting to force things, I've been kind of forced more into a fund of funds model where, you know, we take our pooled capital, invest with other sponsors who specialize in some other asset classes, such as like industrial um, or um, office and you know Ooh, get involved in you're those investing types in office of deals. space well there's a big dichotomy in what's happening there right tell, i think you know there's a there's a big narrative out there and, and most of it is true but i do believe that there is a big difference between a class and then b and c class so a class is your higher end types of properties right right so right now you're having you know employers they want to get their employees back into the office whether that's free beer, free food, but mostly just nicer amenities, right? right. You, you, can't, you can't really entice your, your employee back into the office if you have a crappy class B or C older office. Right. So there's this flight to companies going upstream, right? To the A class, right? right? And maybe even consolidating and getting less square footage too as part of that so that they can afford those higher prices. Have the so amenities it's kind of available a race for the employees and let them enjoy the space. And they're in a shopping mall or shopping center, you know, where they can go eat and, you know, shop and do other things while yeah, they're working. Exactly. Yeah. Stuff I wanted to do when I was in my twenties, but you know, I prefer to just be at home, right? Work from home. But you know, the truth is you need collaboration amongst, you know, people today, right? Like you just can't do death by zoom and you know, where everybody works from home. You need people to collaborate and, you know, network and synergize. And the, the best companies understand this and they need to kind of put money to it. But from an office standpoint, it's those B and C class that are suffering more. And it's the A class that is kind of the, the, the race to the top. So if you kind of focus on those kind of specific deals and more importantly, get, you know, partake in part of the distress and the undervaluing in the market and buy it under replacement cost, then then you have a specific deal on your hands, right? And that's where- well, You're looking at more of the class A space today is what I'm hearing. You were doing a lot of class B and class C stuff previously or lower, lower level, but with interest rates up, 
with office vacancies increasing because people are struggling to get away from the mindset of, you know, they want to work from home. A lot of these people still want to work from home, but businesses want to get us, get our people back in the office. I agree with you. Um, is that what you're seeing then is you, in terms of the investment strategy that you're pursuing? Yeah. And then part of that is like the whole zig when everybody's zagging, right? Yeah. When, when there's that cringe moment that you had there, that's exactly where a sophisticated investor needs to go in and looks at individual deals as opposed to these, you know, blanket statements or blanket sentiments. Um, in the multifamily world, it's a little bit different, right? Like you, you always have different people on different parts of the price point, right? You need B, C class, A class. And, and I, my whole argument on that side, on the residential side is you're having a larger population growth of the lower middle class, right? Immigrants and then the shrinking middle classes and Part of that is like, you know, we, we try to educate people in the middle class with those white collar professions from slipping into that lower middle class, right? right. And, you know, we, we don't like it and we try to fight it, but nevertheless, that's the gravitational pull. And that's where, why we want to invest in that workforce housing sector where, you know, a guy is, you know, paying $800 to $1,200 a month in a rent for their apartment. You have, uh, set up a website and you've also written a book called the the wealth elevator which i want to talk about in a second but the website asks people if they want to invest in these projects that you're involved in and what can you tell a prospective investor about you know how they would invest what kind of return on investment they should ask for in your investments and you know, obviously, I know how these real estate private placements work because I've set up them since 1985. But the question is, what is an investor looking for today and what can you uh, offer them in terms of the investments that you're doing? Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of craftily step to that question and I'll, and I'll answer from a high level, right? Like a lot yeah. of it depends on the operator you're working with. If you're working with a big institutional company um, or, you know, shoot, that's what like your retirement funds are, right? And the right. Wall Street investments, like you'll be lucky to double your money in 10, 15 years in those right. companies, right? Because right. of the bloat and the, the overhead and the high and the fee fees. structures. Yeah. You know, it, on the other end of the spectrum, if you're working with a, you know, newer operator who's kind of, you know, willing to give part of the deal, most of the deal up, you could be looking to double your money in three to five years in some of these value add type of projects or, or maybe even more in a development. Now that's, I'm just identify those are the bookends, right? And right. you as a sophisticated investor, as we were kind of mentioning earlier in my timeline, like I invested with a lot of these newer people and I tell a lot of investors today, one of the rules of thumbs that we have in a free e-course that we have on our site is you know, don't invest with people that haven't done at least $1 billion of deals, right? That's, you know, for what it is, it's, you know, kind of the point when they start to hit their stride, build a team, but you haven't gotten on the scale of an institutional operator where the, the fees and split structures for passive investors have kind of gone downhill at that point, right? right? As many could expect, there's this concept of a sweet spot in the middle. We're somewhere in the middle, right? We've done over $2 billion in deals, over 65 projects plus. Um, and I think like we have the alignment with investors in mind with this. Today, we only take accredited investors, so people over a million dollar net worth. I, I excluding believe, their toward, house. Excluding, yeah, excluding their, their, house. their house. Although that yeah. that's kind of a head scratcher. But then again, I guess take their hint, right? Your house is not an asset. That's what they're saying. <laughs> but, you know, guys that make over a couple hundred thousand dollars a year from their day job, right. um, which is a is a large population out there, actually, that kind of are, you know, available to go into these types of projects. Um, and, you know, we are kind of more relationship based. You know, we, we do a lot of kind of close events and we get to know each other and Investors get to know each other investors, right? Um, it's kind of what I was looking for when I first started out, right? Like, you know, when I was investing in my 10 single family homes all by myself, you know, I, I was a lone wolf. 
I thought I knew a lot, right? I mean, what guy in in their 20s doesn't, right? Like as I did. (laughs) But as I started to branch out and started to meet other accredited investors, that's when I started to uncover all these private placements, these country club deals. But more importantly, this unlocked a lot of the tax strategies that, you know, just go well beyond 401ks and Roth IRAs and backdoor IRAs, stuff like that. Right. And then, you know, you start to add on the infinite banking strategies, like right? this trifecta of taxes, infinite banking and deals is what I've kind of discovered. And I talk about in the Wealth Elevator book that expedites your path to financial freedom or what I call end game at four to five million dollars net worth for most people in about a third amount of time than doing it the traditional fire, you know, financial independent retire extreme way. Um, is it still but- possible to do that in today's environment? You know, it's getting harder and harder, right? Like, you know, when I first started to do this, you could buy a single family home that in a good area and in a place like Birmingham or Atlanta for 900 grand, 900 grand that rented for a thousand bucks. Today, that same property is going for 150, $160,000 and rents for $1,200. So, if, you know, the rent to value ratio is under 1% where you take the monthly rent divided by the purchase price. Right. So it's, Def, it's not getting any easier, man. I mean, the institutions are kind of getting into that single family home space as they are with all these asset classes. And it's just getting harder and harder for the, the little mom and pop investor to make it, which is why you got to combo multiple strategies, the taxes, the the privatized banking to all in conjunction, you know, to minimize the amount of risk that you're taking on the deal side to get to where you want to be. But okay. I mean, I think that's kind of what we, created and like, you know, that's where this whole idea came for me, right? This wealth elevator as I've kind of- Tell us about the wealth elevator. Tell us about the book and and what are the levels that that you're talking about in the book and how can somebody understand this concept a little bit better? Give us a little preview before we buy it. Yeah. So the, the wealth elevator idea is like, it's a shortcut, right? It's a freaking elevator as opposed to taking the stairs, going back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a way, that's a, my journey, right? I kind of had to take the stairs and talk to all these people and invest my money with bad people and lose it and, you know, go through the long way. Yeah. Um, you know, just getting to a credit investor status. You know, I, I invest in my first property 2009. Took me like six, seven years of painstaking, saving 50, 100 grand a year for my stinking job, right? And what I discovered was there's different levels to the wealth building. As I mentioned, as, a, as soon as I became a credit investor, I kind of found a different set of investment strategies and taxes and infinite banking. And, you know, at some point, you you know, retirement accounts don't make sense, you know? Um, So what I created was, you know, in the basement level, I think most people listening, you're probably out of this level, right? This is maybe your, your nephew or niece who just got out of college, right? They're trying to figure out a personal budget, right? This is all the basic stuff, right? But it's identified in the basement level. Most people are, where I first started with good financial skills, that first floor of the wealth elevator, where you know you got a good salary, you're you're saving 25, 50 grand a year, and maybe you start off with some single family home rentals. But then the next level is, you know, for people who save a hundred grand a year or already an accredited investor, you know, making a multiple six figure salary, you know, to buy little rental properties is just a waste of time and it's high liability and the debt's in your own name. And this is where investing through private placements and syndication with honest operators with a good track record come into play. But then by investing in these deals, you unlock all these tax benefits where, you you know, some people don't pay any taxes legally because all the color of their money is not ordinary W-2 to 99 income, but it's passive income where you use the passive losses from the depreciation of the asset to offset it. Or there's some other more advanced strategies that we talk in the book, like you know, like section 179 equipment deductions where you don't have to recapture it at the end of the day to attack your ordinary, your, your passive income. And then real estate professional stats. I know I'm just rattling this stuff off, but like, you know, these are all the strategies that I uncovered from all these people as I started to get around them. And this is the strategies that, that become more in play into the second floor of the, the elevator. Okay. Now I'll say, you know, in, in the book, we have like a chart, right? Cause I'm an engineer, right? Net worth level, income level. And then what do you do for all these kind of facets? You, there's changes, there's small changes in them. Um, and there's also changes in mindset, right? You know, I, I think at, at what we're trying to do for everybody is get them to this four or $5 million end game level. 
which is different for a lot of people. You know, a lot of my clients are out in the West, you know, expensive areas in the West Coast, like California. It's going to be 10 million in California. Yeah. 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 Well, some of them, right. But, you know, most of our people are pretty frugal folks, right? Like we're first generation, first generation multimillionaires is kind of the term. We're not trust fund kids. We made our money. That's who I represent are all the entrepreneurs like you. And uh, yeah. you're right. You've made your money through hard work and smart investing. And that's, yeah. and we're not dummies with our money. That's how we got here. Right. So, you know, f- uh, for $4 million, $5 million at like a you know, a rate of 4%, 5%, that's usually comes down to like 15 to $20,000 is usually more than enough to sustain us, especially once the kids leave for college and they're not no longer financial um, liabilities anymore. <laughs> so the whole Burdens. concept is like, well, let's as safely and quickly as possible get to this four to $5 million level. And then at that point, you know, there's different options. Like, what do you want to do? You want to keep growing it or do you want to just kind of hold it for capital preservation? But at this point, I think the important thing is surrounding yourself with a community of like-minded people and like net worth people who also will go on this journey with you. And and it also makes life a lot richer too, because at some point, typically around two and a half million dollars net worth, you know, social relationships with the right people become the currency of the wealthy. And that's kind of what we could also provide for our folks on the community side that we have with our, our investor group. But that's, you know, like if you want to keep going, right? I mean, that's kind of where I come into play, right? As the entrepreneur, you know, and growing my net worth, you know, I'm able to get into, you know, use my podcast, my my social influence to get myself into different rooms to then glean the next level of strategies, right? Like for example, you know, private placement life insurance is kind of the next generation of infinite banking or captive insurance plans um, or, uh, rollover business startups, right? It's the kind of the next generation, the next level of these 401k, solo 401k plans. But, and then I'm sure, you know, Wayne, you know, maybe you, you guys kind of refer out for like the irrevocable trusts that come into play, right? That it's kind of the next level asset protection right. and long-term estate planning for, right. you know, DECA millionaires and above, right? But there's right. there's never been a book out there that kind of takes people through these paradigm shifts Everything's kind of written for like the broke guy out there who wants to flip a house. He wants or, to get rich quick. Yeah, the get rich quick. And that's just yeah. not, we're not, we're not that, right? Like it took me a long time to get to this point. And that's what I kind of want to reiterate for, for folks. And I think a lot of our investors, they're like, you know, they get caught up in that too, right? They're like, well, you know, I've been doing this for a couple of years now. You know, why am I not retired? And it's like, well, this isn't magic. You know, this isn't crypto. You know, this is value-based investing and it takes a while. If you want that kind of return that fast, you're going to accept a high level of risk. Whereas in the real estate market, there's always risk as well. Obviously, interest rates go up, values go down. It it becomes difficult to, uh, to make as much money as other people have made in the real estate world. But there are ways to do it. And it sounds like, Lane, you have captured the different levels of wealth and the different levels of investing and strategies in your book, The Wealth Elevator. So if somebody wants to get a copy of the book, how do they do that? Um, they can go to iTunes or uh, they can go to Amazon uh, where all fine books are sold out there. <laughs> um, we'll have, I think we'll have the audiobook version at some point, but if they want to, you know, check out the book and get on that pre-list, they can go to thewealthelevator.com slash book. Um, but, you know, as I guess what I find myself, like I'm super passionate about this stuff as it's changed my life. Um, and I've kind of put everything in that book, but, you know, as but part it's on of the like website being, too, right? The wealth yeah, elevator. Like, and, and the podcast is really how this all got started, how the community got started. And, you know, so people listen to podcasts, I would say, check out the podcast, but part of my whole, I guess, role is kind of being the facilitator, right? The guide of people stepping into this uncomfortable alternative investment world from the traditional stuff that we're all used to and we're all told to do. And like one of the things I see is like, you know, most people, what they'll do is they'll start off with maybe 10 to 20% of their net worth into these types of deals in the first three to five years and then just sit and wait. And I get it. It's prudent thing to do, right? Like I got burned when I first started to kind of make my way into this world. And we're not stupid people here. We're not guys who just buy a late like infomercial and just, you know, better thing on black, right? We're, that's not the clientele that we have. We have smart people 
were pretty um, risk risk adverse. And unfortunately, that kind of clashes with the whole diversification piece, right? You want to have a the whole long term plan is as I do, like I have I'm in like 80 or 100 plus deals myself, right? You want diversification over different asset classes, different geographic locations, and different time on the time horizon here. But I write about, you know, these are the types of things, the real world problems that people get into when they're getting into this world that I kind of touch upon in the book, right? So it's an actionable plan, but hey, as you, you're going to run into these types of problems and pitfalls. And, you know, part of that is, you know, surrounding yourself with the right people. You know, you are the five people that you hang out with most. And that was the hard thing when I first started is I didn't know any, I didn't have any rich uncles doing this type of stuff. I didn't know anybody yeah, who had a million dollar did, net worth. Did, or um, <laughs> did, to join your community, should people who are accredited investors go to your website and sign up? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, go to the wealth elevator.com slash club. We, we, we kind of take a very, um, strict approach of onboarding everybody and seeing if it's a good fit both ways. And, you know, just that's the kind of how we started in initially we've obviously grown as a group to well over 800 investors who've invested with us in the past. Um, but you know, that I think that's the way we kind of want to keep organically growing and keep it more of a relationship, you know, I mean, that's kind of what I bring from my side is, you know, here in Hawaii, people know each other, right? It's a, it's a family, it's an ohana, and that's kind of what we wanted to kind of keep. And we use our collective investment power to go and get better splits on, you know, fees, structures, and better prefs and stuff like that. And these um, are and deals that are all across the U.S., not just Hawaii. Right, that's correct. Yeah, you don't awesome. want to invest in Hawaii, in my opinion, you know, to... <laughs> Yeah, I have place a to live, couple of clients who bought property on the on the beach on Oahu, and I I asked them how much it cost, and it was more than I could ever have dreamed of making in my lifetime, let alone you know investing in one property. Um, so it, it is a challenge in Hawaii, I think, uh, to uh, to make a big profit on real estate. But there's plenty of opportunity around the United States and there's areas that are constantly changing and growing. And it's good to know that you guys are investing and uh, still investing and still looking for new opportunities and new challenges obviously face you as we, as we move into an area of economic uncertainty with changes of administration, with all the things that we have to deal with, but uh, um, we adjust and we adapt. And those of us that are the most adaptable will succeed. And it sounds like Lane Kawaoka, you are an adaptable guy and you've, you've done great success at a very young age. So people who want to get in touch with you, go to the, the wealth elevator.com and learn more about how to invest wisely in the real estate world, as opposed to just, you know, trying to make a quick buck. Cause it's very hard to make a quick buck in real estate. Either you're lucky or you're going to get screwed in the end. So try to avoid that. Go to Lane and, and he'll tell you how to do it. And thanks for being a guest on Blueprint for Wealth today, Lane. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Wayne. Aloha, everybody. Aloha. Aloha. And tune in next time for another special guest on Blueprint for Wealth, where we help you realize your dreams of wealth and freedom. Have a great week. Mm-hmm.